So this week I was speaking with somebody uh, and they were sharing with me just some of the things, some of the hardships, some of the, the challenges that have been going on in their world, various um, home dynamics that have been troubling, there's various uh, technology issues that have been going on and there's been a number of um, relational and workplace challenges that um, this particular person has had and been experiencing and and what really got me was when they shared, they said, look, Tim, I just don't know where to go. I, I feel so alone. Where do I go for help? And, and if that is you, if those are similar sentiments to what you are feeling and experiencing, uh, you've come to the right place. And my prayer is this morning that you would be encouraged through what God has to share through me, uh, that God would be uh, speaking to you into your specific circumstance, into your particular time, into your particular occasion. And before I open up the word and, and share about our new sermon series, uh, A Journey to Joy, uh, let's pray and come before God. So Father, right now, I just want to thank you. I thank you so much that you've given me the opportunity to share with your people and, and with uh, those who are joining us from all over the world. And I pray, Lord, right now that you would um, empower me to speak clearly your word, that you would use me to encourage us this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, before I open up Psalm 16, what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time providing a little bit of background, a little bit of a backbone to uh, the Psalms and this sermon series, because we're going to be looking through various key Psalms throughout uh, our next couple of weeks and next number of weeks. And so I want to make sure that we have a great grounding in this, the book of Psalms and, and how they work. So the first thing that I want to share is the book of Psalms is generally thought of as the church's hymn book. Um, it's also thought of a, a, a book of prayer or the hymn book of the Old Testament. John Calvin writes this. He says that in the Psalms, that an anatomy of every part of the human soul is found. In them you will find all human emotion, griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, anxieties, reflected as in a mirror. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to have a look at some of the key ideas of who are the authors, who is the structure, who is the, what are the types of Psalms, uh, what's the genre of Psalms, just so that we can be set up to understand clearly what Psalms is all about. So first thing is the authors. There's many contributors to the Psalms, but there are four main key um, authors. There's the King David is thought of as the, one of the main primary authors. There's the Sons of Korah. You've also got Psalms of Asaph, and you've also got Psalms of Ascents. And so those authors all contribute in different times. Generally, there's a title that shares with you who they are. Some are unknown, some are untitled, so we don't always know who the Psalms are written by. In terms of genre, uh, C.S. Lewis says this about genre. He says that the Psalms are poems, poems that are intended to be sung, not doctrinal treatises, so or even sermons. So uh, I agree 100% with C.S. Lewis that uh, these Psalms are not doctrinal treatises, but there are doctrines inside the Psalms. There, are, there is theology, there is a uh, study of God inside the Psalms. Um, Athanasius, one of the theologians of the 4th century, he says this, that the Psalms are an, an epitome of the whole Scriptures. And Basil, Bishop of Caesarea, he will also say that uh, Psalms are a compendium of all theology. Martin Luther would also go on to say that the Psalms are a little... Bible uh, and that they are the summary of the whole Old Testament. In terms of structure, the Psalms um, is not just a, a book of collected artistic songs to be sung, um, but they are also carefully designed, they're also carefully ordered. Um, there's actually five books of the five separate books in the Psalms. And they're modeled after the, 
the first five books of the Bible, which are considered the books of the law or the books of Torah. And basically each one of these books of the Psalms, book one through to five, has a, has a key overarching theme that help us understand what is going on in the storyline of Psalms. And so book one is actually all about establishing God's kingdom. Book two is all about uh, Solomon's kingship and the baton being passed on to Solomon. Book three is basically where the wheels fall off. And the big question at the end of this book is, where, O oh Lord, is your former great love? And book four talks about, uh, addresses the crisis of exile because um, these Psalms were compiled after. So they're, they're, they're reflecting on the moment in history where the people of God are in exile. And finally, book five talks about living out our faith and, and how do we do that and finishing with this great note of praise, this great note of, of how God is working in our lives practically, tangi tangibly. Um, finally, there's different types of Psalms. So in the Psalms, you, you, you will find a whole heap of different types and styles of Psalms, but I guess there's three basic categories of Psalms. The, the first category is hymns. So they're, they're well-ordered songs. Basically, when life is going well, they're singing for joy. These are great hymns of praise and, and that kind of thing. Normally talking about the great things God has done in creation and the big, broad brushstroke. The second theme, the second category, sorry, of the Psalms is thanksgiving. So in the Psalms, there's these personal moments where as, as the psalmist or the author is reflecting on how God has personally saved them out of a crisis or a problem, and they're now just reflecting and praising God. And so that is a great, um, great category of Psalms. And then the third category is the category of lament, the, the category of sorrows, like why, O oh Lord, um, is probably the question that summarizes that category. And so as all of these um, genres and these types and these uh, structures are interwoven, we can understand a little bit of when we're reading, where we're reading in the Psalms, what the Psalms are about and the key message and thrust and idea of what the Psalm is trying to communicate. So without further ado, why don't you join me? Why don't you come and join me? Grab your Bibles. We're going to be having a look at Psalm 16 and Psalm 16 is a great Psalm of confidence. And so the two ideas that I want to share with us this morning about Psalm 16 and, and our series being a journey to joy. And I want to talk about our journey to joy starts with a confidence in the Lord and our journey to joy ends with living out countercultural lives. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you uh, turn with me and, and we're, we're going to spend some time uh, just thinking and reflecting and, and reading this great psalm. So Psalm 16 says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones in whom all my delight is. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, my heart also instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let my Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever more. How encouraging is that? So I want to talk about our journey to joy starts with a confidence in the Lord. 
And the, the whole point of the, the a number of verses throughout this passage, verse 1 and 2, verses 7, verses 10, is really around sharing confidence in the Lord that He is worthy to be trusted, His promises are worthy to be trusted, and His work is worthy to be trusted because we've seen in the past what He has done. And so what I want to say is that our culture does not take this this idea, this, this idea of trusting in something outside of itself, because actually a lot of the, the common mantra of our society is you've got to trust yourself more. You've got to have more confidence in yourself, who you are. You've got to be, uh, you know, just think about yourself more positively. But what happens when, when the wheels fall off? What happens when there is trouble in your life that you cannot fix? There's certain things that you're not competent in and that you aren't able to do on your own. Are you supposed to just continue to to blindly just trust in yourself? Or what the Bible or, or what our psalmist does instead? Should we be thinking more about reflecting our eyes outward, looking up, looking outward to someone greater, to a good and great God who is here in our present time of need to be able to work and make a way where there is no way. Now, if my preaching is good, please share some likes, share some love hearts, because that will really encourage me. So let's look at David's words closely. He says, my Lord, in verse 2. And basically, he sees God as his master over all the universe and his personal master that he reports to. And so God is this great Lord and master But the important thing that you see here is that he says that there is no good apart from you. He sees God as a master, but he doesn't see him as a master that that treats him like rubbish, that, that puts all the good things aside. And so that he has to just deal or just enjoy the the second rate things, the things that aren't as good. But God is a good God and there's no good gift. There's no good thing outside of what God provides for us. And so uh, as I was thinking about this, I was just reminded of myself growing up and, and in the household, I had a brother and, and we would get hungry sometimes, right? A boy's got to eat. And so what would happen is uh, we would do a first cut, do a first run through of the pantry, of the fridge, of, of all the general places where you would store food, obviously. And uh, we would look through and, you know, there's a few things there. There's some fruit. There's some different things. We'd have that. We'd enjoy that. Uh, but we're still hungry. So we do a second cut. We do a third cut. And we'll ask our parents, like, is there any more food, right? Uh, is there anything? And, and basically the, the comment was, what you see is what you get. But as we got older, we realized that, that there was actually... Uh, a a difference between the food coming into the house and the food that was presented in the pantry and in the visible areas of where the food normally is kept. And what we realized is when we got smart is that there's food being hidden in other places in the house. So when we were hungry, we realized that we could look in other areas of the house, like behind the detergent in the laundry, there was a little depository of food. Uh, behind, in the office, in the office drawers, in the different places of the house, behind the linen cupboard, in the spare room. There was food in all kinds of different places. And what I'd begun to realize is that I had to keep looking outside to find satisfaction for the needs and the hunger inside of me. Well, this is a picture of who God is not. God is not this insufficient God that we have to go outside to find satisfaction and to find a a quench or a a remedy for our souls. But God is all sufficient in himself. And my question for us this morning is, when will you and I stop looking outside of what we've been given in Jesus and look inside with what we've been given in Jesus and celebrate, enjoy and rejoice in that. You see, because there is a reason why we, we, we scroll endlessly at the end of the day on social media, on, on online, 
We're looking for things to satisfy. There's a reason why when we wake up every morning, we find ourselves just inundated with material and ideas and videos and and they do provide a bit of a spark, a rise, but we're still searching and craving. Um, But in God, when will we run to Him and enjoy Him and enjoy His presence? When will we trust in God like the psalmist says, for in you I take refuge. In you I go and take refuge. You see, this is such a contrast to the initial lie that set humanity into a spin. Adam would find himself doubting the goodness of God and the snake whispering a lie. Is God really that good? Is he true? Is is he holding back on you? Why don't you indulge in this? But the psalmist, no way. He says, no, I go to you and I find refuge in you. I run to you when things get tough. And you see, he knows this because he says that in verse 10, he says that you will never abandon me to Sheol. You will never do that. And what Paul, uh, what David is most likely thinking is that, that he won't die at a young age because God will protect him and he will pre- preserve his life till the end of his life. But actually, in the New Testament, Peter talks about this. Paul talks about this in Acts, that there is actually a resurrection that we look into this passage and we can see that actually this passage is not just talking about David being abandoned, but it is actually reflecting and talking about the confidence we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've just celebrated that. And what we can see and what we can enjoy and what we can celebrate in is the fact that we have a God who doesn't abandon us, but he actually went where we should go and that he was raised from death into life. And now we celebrate victoriously that we have a God who would not abandon us, who would not say, Uh uh-uh, not going there, or when things get tough, I'm going to bail out. But we have this assurance that we can trust in God, that He is all sufficient and that He has conquered death so that we then can conquer death. And now, friends, this is not just a fairy tale or a good story. This is historical fact. This is uh, based on evidence and the truth of history and historians that even outside of Christian faith would report on this fact. The tomb is empty. We can celebrate that church. We can enjoy that sunlight. We can have a great assurance that we have a God in Jesus Christ that we can trust in and we can look back in history and say we have confidence that we do not have to go through this circumstance fearing for what's going to happen in the end, because we know we can have assurance of God who is walking and working in our lives. And this brings us to point two, because our trust and our confidence where we start should result in this courageous counter-cultural living. When I was growing up, before I met Jesus, um, my friends and I would drink until we were intoxicated and we would find great joy in that. We would think that was hilarious. We would even experience a a, a whole lot of, um, of, of, I guess, numbness of our our present pain and, and it was just such a great time. But as I look back, I don't see that that time was a a joyful time. I don't see that time as a dignified and and respectful time. And it was actually a degrading time. Vomiting, wetting your pants, finding, saying things about other people that are just crude and horrendous and evil. That wasn't glorifying. God, that was not celebrating the the human kind and the nature in which we have been made in the image of God. But actually, we see things differently. Like the psalmist David, he actually says that he says that the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. But I will not. I will not engage. He says, I've got something better to live for. I've got something to 
enjoy and rely in and celebrate for, I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to look outside of God. So David runs to God. He finds his portion in God. He actually says it this way. The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup, and you hold my lot in verse 5. He goes on and says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken in verse 8. So what do these declarations mean? What do they mean for us? How, what, what are we supposed to make of portion and cup and, and lot? Well, the portion, he's actually talking about the distribution of land. And so that was a big deal for Israel because they got given different portions of land. But notice it's not actually David saying, um, the land is what I delight in. He says, you are my portion. The Lord is my portion. So we get to see that David is actually reflecting on God is actually his greatest joy and his highest priority. And we can also see that in the, this idea of a cup, biblical writers would often use the term of cup for a sense of love with someone or a sense of fellowship or a sense of celebration. And so as we look at this metaphor of the cup, we see that the Lord is uh, his source of love. The Lord is his source of strength. That is what the metaphor is giving us. And as I was thinking about this, I was, I was thinking, you know, there's been a lot of changes in the wood family household. There's been a lot of things that um, have been changing. I've started working from home. Um, the, Judah's been back at school, our eldest son, and, and our youngest is now out of daycare and he's sort of bopping around home full time and everyone's home full time. And uh, so Kelsey and I desperately were trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, how do we find uh, ways in which we can educate our boys, that they can have some fun, that they can develop some skills and, and enjoy life. And so we, we want them to celebrate in this season. We don't want them to experience um, negative experiences and emotions through this season. So we bought some books, we bought some toys, we bought some crafts and activities. We've, we've got some, some great educational material. And uh, I thought, great, I've set it all up. And uh, they're going to be able to, you know, go for it, you know, for, for the whole day and for in, enjoy time together, boys playing together, that kind of thing. And uh, as I'm working in my office and, uh, and, and I'm sitting there, I, do you think that they're going to be satisfied with just the good gifts that I give my kids, the good gifts that I give them uh, as a dad? No, they're not satisfied. In fact, you know, within two minutes, Daddy, yes, can we make a cubby? Okay, nah, can't do it. Daddy, can we play hide and seek? Daddy, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do this? And what I've discovered is whilst the good gifts of God can satisfy us for a little time, what we really need, what we really want, our heart's desire is the Father's love. The presence of God. Just like my boys just want my presence and want my celebration and touch and love. So do we as humans want the love and touch of the person of God. We don't just want his gifts. They'll satisfy for a little while, but we want Jesus. And the real joy is that at the end of time, that we will enjoy him forevermore as the psalmist has written. That we can really enjoy the, the greatness of his gifts, but also the person of God for eternity. And so this morning, I want to leave us with this. That your joy doesn't begin with your financial needs met. Your joy doesn't be met by your relational needs in other people. Your joy doesn't begin with your physical strength as much as you a focus and that's important. It doesn't begin with having a great um, aesthetic, but the joy that is true joy, true satisfaction in our lives, it is that joy that we can only find in the person and work of Jesus that He would love us unconditionally, that He would die and rise from the dead, be seated in heaven that we can enjoy Him forever.
and we can have in confidence in that. And that's gonna 